I'm doing a little YouTube series because I've been working in the industry since two, well, I started at college in 2005 and I just want to speak to writers, directors, actors, filmmakers across the spectrum and just like, how did you start? How did you get to where you are? What advice would you give to people? It's just that simple. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Where did it start? <laughs> Where <laughs> so, did it start? Where did it all start? What What made you go? Because for me, I used to write short stories when I was about 10. Um, my dad gave me his old work laptop, and I think it was to keep me quiet and to keep right. me quiet. And I used to just start writing short stories about my pets, like who could talk, of course. Oh, I, that's lovely. It must have been about the time when animals of farming wood was a thing. I don't know if you remember Anna was a farming wood on CBBC and it was this beautiful animation about foxes and all the all, like owls and hedgehogs and everything and they were I think they lived in a, a farm or a field and then it got built over by roads and they had to find this new place to go and like every few episodes an animal would die a horrible tragic death. Uh... And it was just... That sounds like the sort of thing I'd like, actually. Yeah, it, it was like the water, a watered-down version of Watership Down, I would say. Right, right. Like C, C, B, CBBC appropriate. But that I think that's what started it for me and just my imagination. I've always had an overactive imagination. So, yeah. I, so, and then when I was about 14, 15, I reached out. I was very into anime and manga and all that sort of stuff. Oh, and, yes. There was a That's movie great. called Giver, uh, and it was based on the anime. And I reached out, ran, you could do this back then. This was before Twitter. Yeah. And I reached out to the director, Steve Wang, and I said, right. I want to know how to write films. And he went, here you go. And he sent me his scripts. That's the best way. Right? The best way, the best way to learn to write, without doubt, is to read screenplays for films that you haven't seen. Um, and so, so you're not just being reminded of films that you've seen, but the films that you haven't seen, and then see them and see how, how it works, if they've been made, if you're lucky. Or I got started on writing um, when I was at the, I went to National Film School. I didn't go as a writer. I went as a director and as an editor. My, my background was as, a, um, as an actor and as a theatre director. And I'd gone to whole whole drama department, and when I got to um, the the National Film School, I sort of fell into writing. It wasn't I'd always been told that my writing was crap, that I couldn't spell, you know, that I had that I just didn't know how to do it. And so I would draw I would draw pictures, and and as a kid, I as a little kid like you, I made up stories. I think all children do, um, uh, and and I enjoyed doing that a lot um and then um and then and then i did was a child actor and then i was and then i and then i was directing theater um at, at Hull university drama department and uh, and on a bit from there and then i got some jobs in the film industry i was working as a runner um for at ridley scott associates which is oh, wow. uh, um which was making commercials then. It was like 19, very early 70s. And, um, and then I got uh, promoted from that to being an assistant editor. Um, and then I went to universities. And then, so every vacation, I would go and work on commercials because it paid well. Yeah. Um, and or for always assistant, paid better. <laughs> yeah. As, as, an, as an assistant editor. Um, and uh, so I, so I got that. So when I went to the film, film school, I wasn't thinking about um, writing at all. Um, I developed a relationship with a writer called Steve Gooch, who'd written a play called Female Transport that I loved and I'd done on stage. And, um, and I wanted to make that as a film. And I kept on going in at, at the National Film School you, at that time, it was run very early 70s it was sort of it was very loose and easy going but the one thing it did have at that time was that when you wanted to make your film with your budget and sort out your you sorted out your own course it was very you know it was you it wasn't dictatorial at all 
Um, but the one thing they did have was when you wanted to make your film, it had to go through a committee um, upon which sat people like David Putnam and Alan Parker. And, you know, it was wow. a big, it was a, it was a, and a few students and all the, <laughs> all the, all the, all the, all the staff, all the, all the instructors who were great. And they would constantly get my script um, for um, female transport that Steve Gooch was writing and I'd put some of my budget into. And they'd go, no, no, you're insane. You want to do a, 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 a 50 minute short on a square sail ship, you know, <laughs> it was like, this was as a director. And then they said, they, so in the end they said, no, listen, are they, you, you, you have to start writing because this is theater. What you've got here is, is very theatrical. Um, uh, and so the guy who ran the writing department was a guy called John Bryce. And he, um, um, his claim to fame, I suppose, was that he developed the original Avengers Oh, wow. um, and uh, and he an armchair theater on maybe um, on, on 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 what would have been independent television then or ABC or whatever it was. Anyway, he was a lovely, lovely man. He's with us no longer, unfortunately. And and uh, and he he just said, "Well, Matthew, go. You know, the next dream you have that you think would be a good film, write it down." And that's how I started. I wrote. I got up one morning after having had a very weird dream um, where I was outside of myself in the dream. And I wrote that down um, and uh, it was more like a poem than a, than a screenplay. Um, you know, it was just like a success, an idea that was sprung by this one image. Um, of, uh, so it wasn't a very good script, but I, I, gave, I, gave it, I gave it to him and he loved it. And he poked his head out the door and said, Matthew, come in here now and have some champagne. You know, <laughs> he was like one of those, he was, he was the hedonist of the first <laughs> order. <laughs> anyway, what he did, um, which was great, was I was always broke. Still, still am. <laughs> it's just, I was a broke, was it, was it that? Chris Rock says my pronoun is broke, um, and but he he was uh, he was saying well we can get you this job for rank distributors um, every week you'll get two scripts um, and you'll be paid fifteen pounds for each script to read to write a synopsis to write what you think to write the ca- you know coverage yeah, yeah, yeah so so but. I'd never done that before and I hadn't read a lot of scripts. And so it was great. It's exactly what you're talking about. Um, uh, it was great to read the scripts. Not, they were good scripts, obviously, because they were going into production. They were being offered to rank from all right. over the world to see if rank wanted to buy them. Um, so they were working scripts. They were scripts that, that worked. And just doing that, um, reading two features and doing reports on them, for for a, a well over a year, I got so into the groove of of what a script needed to look like, um, and, and how a script worked, and how it's really a tool yeah. um, for you know to to help you make the movie, yeah. right? And so so it's not something to be afraid of. Writing for publication, I would still be afraid of doing that. Um, but it's but but at that point it was like oh, I could do this, um, and so I started doing it, and I started doing it for friends at the film school, and then they you know and other and other and I would write and produce and direct. You do everything you can, is my advice really. Sort of if you love something, explore every angle of it, and and whatever you do, don't give up because you keep saying people keep saying no, and that's just the default. The default is is the film doesn't happen, um, and the and so you have to accept that it's not going to happen. It's like if you're going to be an actor, you have to accept that you're going to have to go to tons of auditions, not get a role, and then eventually you'll get one. So you just keep knocking, and and eventually people answer. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think I think it does. <clears throat> I think the I think the blank page used to be so scary for me, like yes. Until I started working with two great writers, so one of them was uh, Debbie, Debbie Moon, and 
Debbie wrote Wolf Blood for CBBC and she's done a stack of other things since. But for some reason, Debbie decided she was going to be my mentor. God bless oh, her. that's nice. But it, I think what really helped me, because I used to just sit down and not know what, I would know what the story was, but I didn't know how it began, what the middle was or the end. So I went on the journey just as much as <laughs> Garrett has went along on the journey. And for some reason, it was a it was a successful wing and a prayer. But Debbie <laughs> and my script editor, James, he and, and Debbie, they're like, no, 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 no. Go back to the first page. <laughs> <laughs> right, write, down, write down what it is from the beginning, the middle and an end on a page. And then from there, we're going to break it down into scene by scene. And I was like, amazing. What is that? <laughs> like, it's just a light. It's <laughs> It's like, oh, wait a minute. This is making sense. And then once you get into that, you, you end up doing your breakdown. And then once you've got your recipe, as I like to call it, for I your... I call it that as well. I sometimes call it like going shopping, you know, when we yeah. walk around the, um, a supermarket and, and we go, oh, I'll have this and I'll have that. And you want your shopping list. So so I, I, I call it like a shopping list. I need some of this. You call it a recipe. It's good. I call it a recipe. But I think a lot of new writers in particular are scared of notes. How, what do you how think do you that is? Books? I think it's it's a fair scare, um, as they, as you might say. I mean, and I think you should be scared of notes. You should be fucking terrified of notes. Sorry, but you should be. <laughs> oh, straight away. But, 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 I'm but not it, but it's, <laughs> it's um, I have I I I feel as though it's the question is that you have to ask yourself whenever you hear a note is why do you think the person is giving you that note, not should I make all the sentences shorter or should I do this, this or whatever it is? Why is, the, why is the person giving you the note? So if you can come back to them when you get a note with, with a question that goes a little deeper into the reason why they're giving you the note, then often you can find something that's incredibly useful. People have a tendency to offer solutions and that's... that's um, you know, you, you don't always, you're the one who should be doing the solutions. So the fear of, of listening to notes is, is something that's very tangible. Uh, and it's fair because it's like walking around in a park with your baby in a stroller and somebody comes up and says, oh dear. And you go, what? What? Your baby's nose. I know uh, every baby with a nose like that I've ever seen dies at the age of three. So, so you dash off to the, <laughs> to the plastic surgeon. You're about to have do a nose job on your baby, um, oh. and then sense prevails. Um, <laughs> why did the guy say that, or why did the person say that? You know what I mean. So, yeah. is it is not important to not to act on notes because they're talking about something you love. Yeah, hopefully. Um, uh, and uh, you know, and if you're writing from, if you're just, you know, if you're doing a job, right? If it's if it's just writing for higher stuff, yeah. which I've done a lot of, you have to really bring yourself to the table, um, because that's why you get those jobs. Essentially, is that you bring yourself to the table. So on a writer for hire job, you have to be more aware of what you're bringing to the table um, than ever. Because that's what keeps you, that's what keeps people coming back to. That, that leads brilliantly to my next question. That's an excellent segue. How did you go from reading scripts and doing synopsis to writing your own to eventually going out and doing Muppet Television and the Young Indiana Jones? And, you know, how, how did you go from A to B? I'm sure it wasn't A to B. I'm sure it was A1, A2, A3, and then B. But, like, I'm curious to know, how did you go from there to there? Oh, gosh. It's a very... Um, there's no sort of set path. Goodness, no. If you think, if you think this is going to be a set path, or, or then, then you're going to be surprised, because opportunities come along in the strangest way. Um, and they, they, you know, you're... I... I basically was doing writing because it was a way of me earning money. It was the early 80s and there was lots of straight to video stuff. And so I was sort of churning out things like Ninja Mission and, and uh, you know, some, Roger 
Christians, Tom, various titles, Lorca and the Outlaws, Starship, things like that. But but they were pretty terrible. Uh, no offense to the to the filmmakers, but it would be like it would be like you write them, they get made. And yeah. I really liked that philosophy. I obviously read about you know Coppola starting in in you know for Corman and people starting in in the in the sort of B B movie world. Oh. And, uh, and and so uh, so I was more than happy to do that. So as a result, I started you know, getting other filmmakers. Primarily, that's the main use of going to film school is you meet other filmmakers, um, and then they give you work and you give them work, and, and and that's how it should work, and that's kind of what happened. So so I was in the same year as as Roger Christian who. Um, who'd come to the National Film School with already with two Oscars. He already had an Oscar for set decoration on Star Wars, and he had an Oscar for um, and I think he'd been nominated for Alien, um, and then and he had another one that he got uh, for making a short. So he was already well qualified, and we both worked for for Ridley Scott and Tony Scott. So we had a sort of common language while other people were poo-pooing the commercial nature of the film at the film school. We'd be quietly standing in the dinner queue going, yeah, but you know, this is what we do. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and he was, so we got on very well mm. and he um, started giving me work. And so even while I was at school. So, so before I graduated, I was given, um, I had a little, I, I even had an office, I think, at, at, at Paramount on Wardour Street. Um, and I was rewriting a sci-fi movie for him that he'd uh, been commissioned for him and he didn't like the writer's work on it. So I was already working, do you know what I mean, before I left. Wow. In the, um, I, I think the industry has really changed though. I think that having that kind of, but that was how the change sort of happened. So the first, the first um, serious work I got was as a writer. Um, uh, and then I started getting other work and then I was directing pop promos. And I, I was probably, I was the sort of Edward of pop promos. I would go in there and I would pitch something wonderful that um, the guy called Knocker Knowles at MCA um, loved and he'd say, oh, well, yes. And I'd, so I'd do a musical youth. Yeah, it was great. It was a way of making films. And you had, you had, um, you had a week to basically make, make it because, wow. um, because what would happen is the song would be there. Then they'd send the song out to the few companies that they were. I was with John Roseman TV and my, my collaborator who I worked with a lot, Bernard Rose was with, uh, Aldabra, which became working title, and uh, um, and it was and he was churning out videos for them, and uh, so everybody would get the little cassette, and then you'd and then you'd make up your pitch or your script, yeah. and if you had any kind of a track record, you would be brought in to do the pitch, um, but John Roseman TV had a big track record, so so I went straight in. And and I'd pitch a wonderful video. I'd basically put the um, put the single on, and then I'd kind of perform the the whole film as I imagined it. And they'd love that. And then um, then they'd give you like fifteen thousand or twenty thousand or fifty thousand or sixty thousand, depending upon the the scale of the artist and the budget. And then you had a week basically to make it, and then it had to be ready for the for the for Thursday week was was top of the pops and it had to be ready for top of the pops um and then we go in so that was a tremendous training but the transition to going from going to writing to from reading um scripts to writing was very quick because i because i said oh that's how it works and i carried on doing the reading it carried on getting better and then i evolved um with uh um, through getting to know other writers, that was the great thing about the school then, and I think it still applies, is, you know, you could say, I would like to, um, I, you know, I'd like to meet Paddy Chayefsky. you know, I'd like to meet something like this, and then they would bring them in, and you had a budget, and, 
and the students decided who they were going to bring in. Whereas now you don't need to do that because now now you've got everything's available um, on on the internet. There's all sorts of fantastic. If you want to go and study with someone, you can. Um, uh, so the main advantage for film student now is is finding your film family, as they say. Yeah, I mean it's. I think it's. I think it's good and bad. Like I think the the landscape's changed because when streaming services started, it was really exciting because it was like they're gonna need content, they're gonna need material, and I felt like a window had opened for people. And now it's like, no, we're gonna make your show or your film, and then we're just gonna cancel it. We're just gonna put it in the bin because it's more, it's worth more to us in the trash than it sometimes is. they don't even. I think Disney has made a couple where they, they, they're not even allowing them to see the light of day because yeah. it costs too much. Where they've spent, you know, scores of millions of dollars and, and pounds. And, yeah, Batgirl was a prime example. Like, and, and I'm in Glasgow, so I was right. seeing Batgirls getting shot. And right. so I saw the little tiny bit of it and I was like, this is going to be great. Like, good. And then, and then it hit. I was like, nah, I'm not putting it in the bin. And I just think that's that's terrified because how f- how far along are you going to get? Like, where where does it stop? <laughs> where, at what point does that stop? Is it you could hand in a script tomorrow and they could go, brilliant, we're going to go make your film, and then the day after, like, no, 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 we're not making your film anymore. So, like, I just have, have you been supplying stuff for the streamers then? Eh, uh, no, not no. I oh, you you think of me highly. Um, <laughs> so I I I did a web series. Uh, from like 2015 to 2018 right. called Cops and Monsters best title that you'll ever hear and uh, literally it was Taggart meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer right? oh, lovely, that's fantastic uh, that should go And uh, well, it went, so when there's a web series, we crowdfunded it all, we raised enough money not not an, a lot of money we raised enough money and we went and made 10 episodes um, and, it, and then I got a distributor and it went up on Amazon Prime and it has horrible reviews so that's fun for everybody. But, when you say horrible reviews, were they the reviews from the punters? Oh, just or the punters. reviews from oh, the no, reviewers. No, no, oh no, the reviewers like it. Like yeah. we've, had, we've had, like we are definitely a cult kind of show. What's and the name of the show? Cops and Monsters. Cops and Monsters. What, got, a great name. Oh, well, what was really good about it, right? Is that so? I got James T. Harding on board as my script editor, but he ended up coming. We basically took the whole show back to scratch and we worked it all out together and we took what scripts we had for series one that we didn't use and we put it all together and we made a plan for the for six episodes and we went and shot them and then we decided we wanted for we we're, we're going to do series two but we wanted it more serialized and we wanted six because the first series was like seven minutes long 15 minutes long 25 right because right. it was youtube right so it was fine but we decided, no, we're going to do six 25-minute episodes because we were mental. And we went to the BBC writers' room and we said, can you advertise that we're looking for writers? And about 2,000 people got in touch. Whew. Right? So we're like, send us your specs, but oh God. don't send... I know, I know. But we're like, but don't send us a script set in the world of Cops Monsters because we can't read it. Uh, and the amount of scripts we got were like interior cops and monsters head office. We're like in the bin, in the bin, and so that whittled it down quite quick, right? Yeah. So we whittled it down to like forty writers, and we interviewed forty of them on Zoom together. Madness. Mm-hmm. And then we picked three, and then we had a. So I think we had. So it was me, Debbie, Laura, James. Simon and Phil, so six of us. But we got to do a virtual writer's room and I was showrunning it and it was my first time doing that. So it was really nice to showrun a show at, oh, at a completely yeah, independent absolutely. level. But what was really so we got we got to do one episode, we got to crowdfund one episode and we got to shoot one episode and then every every other time we tried to get money to do the next episode died, dead on it, dead on arrival. So we eventually gave it up. I'm now doing it as an audio series because I was like, right, no, we're not. It's not dying. I'm going to go back and do this as an audio series. But 
what was infuriating was that the people at BBC Scotland, where I, I got a job in BBC Scotland, I was a runner, so I remember the runner pain, but I only ever got as far as researcher. And then I left the BBC and now I'm an assistant producer. I had a documentary go out on BBC Alba, a Hogman A, about Scottish fairy tales. Things are, I was there right. and now here. But BBC Scotland, the people in that building who love cops and monsters and they're like, we should be making cops and monsters. And I was like, you yeah. should be. And uh, they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you the, this budget. We'll go do six time minute episodes, da, 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 da. Just go speak to the head of digital. Tell them that you've spoken to me and we want this to happen. So you go to the head of digital and they're like, I spoke to such and such, they want it to happen. No, thank you, we're not interested. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of, you know, there's... I'm used to it now. You're used to it now. I mean, it's one of the reasons, one of the, it's one of the reasons I, I came to the, I came to the States was because at least here, the default tends to be yes, and then you find out it's no. <laughs> but but it's but but so so they they'll 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 their way of saying no is to say yes. Yeah. And then so so it's a kind of a very um, proactive. It's very rainy here today. Oh, um, it's I'm very happy. very pro proactive um, environment. You know, people will make stuff. That sounds great. Cops and monsters. I had I had a thing. That I got hired on to after, after I'd done, um, I did I did a thing Emperor's New Groove, and after I'd done that, I started getting no, lots of. I have of, a, I have lots a of, for that. Yeah, but no. hang on a second. Okay. After after that, I got lots of animated animated movies, and, okay. and one of them was um, became Monsters versus Aliens. Oh. Um, that, which is why I thought it was some relevance. Yeah. Um, which is a high, uh, you know, equally a high concept, you know, and and uh, where it started out with me it was at DreamWorks, and they they came along and they had this. There was this nineteen eighties comic strip called Rex Havoc, um, R E X Havoc, um, and um, and it was in a. Politically, in, it was like a 1980s politically inappropriate <laughs> fringe um, comic strip, the comic book that, that all the animators loved and wanted to do. Right. So they were determined um, to, to make this. Um, uh, and so I was given the job of, you know, coming up with story, um, you know, coming up with the overriding story. And... Um, and uh, I, I went away and I, I did what I'd been trained to do from things like Young Indy and, or, yeah. you know, and of bits of some, bits of Star Wars games and things. You know, it's all about the world, creating the world, creating the, not just the rules of the world, but, but you know, envisioning enough to yeah. supply you with 15 minutes. So that's what I did, was I created, you know, I did a 20 page document that could have covered about, about 15 films and, and they they were and of course the guy who was running who still is uh katzenberg um, was running he he would be very hands-on and he would sit down and he would say you know he would say no no it's, I just, this really has to be very short you know what have you done matthew what have you done and i said well i've done what what you're going to need to have done anyway to find the best story out of all of these things and creating a show like cops and monsters or creating a show like anything like that is amazing is an amazing training and i i think it's the best way um of of you know getting your mind around the process of of coming up with you know with shows and with films is it's the only way of doing it is to do it and yeah, that sounds I think really there's stupid no, there's but, no you know, not to make something I feel yeah I feel exactly. like that we so during lockdown I took cops and monsters one step further because I'm mad and stubborn and yeah. during lockdown we were all kind of going a bit crazy anyway so I came up with an idea for another tv show and it's very Gaelic or Gaelic yes. and it's origins of the layoff and it's set origins of the whale layoff 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 what does that mean? Oh, that Gleok means um, god or goddess in Gaelic. Oh, okay. 
right. And I came out of it again back to Buffy because I grew up on Buffy, right? Right. I, I grew up on Buffy, but then I graduated to Angel, which was the better of the two shows, and I and I wouldn't hear anything less. So, um, I again I went to Buffy meets Outlander because Outlander is obviously this crazy behemoth of a show that's not written by any Scottish people whatsoever. So there right. there's a paradox for you. But uh, I came up with this idea. We went, I was like, right, we'll go shoot a sizzle reel to help us pitch it. And during right. lockdown, we raised about £22,000 on wow. Kickstart, Indiegogo, I think it was. And yeah. we went and we shot a three-day, we went shot for three days. We got period costumes rented. We had prosthetic makeup for the monsters because it's all based on Scottish fairy tale. So right. we, we, we picked we picked a monster, uh, the Bini, who's like this washerwoman who, if you're able to sneak up on her and catch her, she will grant you your future. She'll tell you what's going to happen in your future. But right. if you if she catches you with her hair, she'll whip your legs and paralyze you, and you're you're either dead or you have to explain to your wife why you've got whipped legs. Whipped legs. So we we picked her as our kind of bad. <laughs> And we went Scottish folklore, man. It's crazy, and I love it. I love it, bit of it. So we went and shot a sizzle reel. Got a producer attached in Australia. It's kind of been rolling along. We're not there yet, but I've created the along with Debbie and James because they're my team. We've created the outline for series one, the outline for series two, the outline for series three. We got a a board game is in the works because my producer is like IP, IP, IP. Yes, yes, uh, so you got to do everything you can. I've written a pilot for a, a prequel spin-off animated series aimed at a younger audience because the show is set now, but the animated show is set in the 18th century. Right. Because right. budget won't matter when it comes to animation and to that degree. To, well, yeah. You know. Uh, Depends how you do it. Yeah, we've got video game plans. I've got a comic, a prequel comic book coming out later this year for it. Um, we've got some merchandise sorted. So anyway, I have got the full spectrum. There is. Oh, well done. There you go. You're doing exactly what what the right thing. There's an, you create you create a world. But at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself, well, what is my question? Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's the most important thing in terms of um, advice. You, um, different ways of finding your voice um, uh, and, and recognizing what is the question that drives you, what's your theme. Um, uh, and um, inevitably, um, it, it's probably familiar, you know, probably stuff that, that you, know, you might have a very unique theme, you might have something very unique going on. But if, when you find it, it really helps you know what you're bringing to the table so that if you're working on a, on a, you know, on a rip-roaring comedy or, or if you're working on a very serious drama, you know, you're still bringing, in a way, the same question to the table, you know. And, and, uh, um, and it just means there's your comfort zone. It means it stops you from getting blocked. It stops you from lots of, lots of things. And I, 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 I approach the whole, as I approach filmmaking as a sort of a holistic, not holistic, what would it be? As a sort of smorgasbord of, of, um, of, of delights, yeah. things that you can do, you know, it's, it's fantastic to work with actors. It's fantastic to act. It's fantastic to, it's fantastic to sort of edit, you know, each stage, the key is to enjoy it. Um, and, and, uh, because the likelihood is no, nobody gets rich in no. making these shows. And no. so, so, so you, so the reward is the work itself. Yeah, you can, it is absolutely a, a passion career. Like, it's not a career that you're going to retire on. You hope that you maybe can have an IP that runs and runs and runs. You hope. I've been very lucky that I have, a, um, I get, I get, because um, I'm now 67. So I, and I, I get Writers Guild of America benefits. So, yeah. so they, they have, I don't think the WGGB really does this, which yeah. is, if for every hundred that you're paid, they have to pay an extra 28 or 30 um, on top of that. And half of that, half of, half of that goes to your health 
um, insurance. Oh, wow. So you have complete coverage. Um, and the other half, 15% of that, becomes um, savings, which the Writers Guild save for you. Okay. And then when you get to a certain age, you can, I think you can leap in at 58 even, um, uh, if you've got enough there, um, then you can start picking up your benefit and then you can carry on working. You take a year off, or not a year off, you take six, six months, I think, off. And then you come back and you start building up a new pension. So here, the Writers Guild is organized as a um, proper union, yeah. which obviously we went on strike last year. And we, and, uh, um, I mean, you don't always get what you want, but, but it's kind of, it's kind of good to know that there is support there. Yeah. And I, and I get, I get a monthly benefit, um, which I got from doing all the stuff I did basically in the nineties and the early two thousands when I was doing them and then in the eighties when I was doing very commercial stuff. Yeah. And, uh, so off of that, I get a pension, you know, I suppose I'd call it a pension, but it's enough to cover my rent. See, that's I great guess. because then that's I can write what I want. I have absolute respect for the writers guild over here as well. Um, yeah. I'm not no, the writers guild is great. I'm kind of like I'm on I'm I'm like the there's like the writers guild and then there's like one under it and there's like apprentice writer it's like writer guild junior. <laughs> I think it's where oh, I'm they have that here as well. Yeah, I'm yes. sitting at the moment and it's great and it's so good to know because I I have had situations where I've been screwed over before, so it's good to know that someone's got your back. But I think what I like what's good about the writers guild over there is that you're saying that they put the money in the pensions for you and the savings for you whatever because we it's are very good pension, are not. Yeah. We're not financially responsible. We're not financially. I know. I think. I think here they know that that. I mean, I did have some savings, but then you have a family, um, and uh, and you spend as soon as the sort of family, you know, the the is that is that so, so I worked my way through my savings, and the and I was so relieved to re you know, and I always was relieved to know that there was that security there. I think. You know, writers um, do get exploited, um, and and it sort of kind of goes with the territory. You know, your people come along and they say, "Well, you could write this speculatively," and and now more than ever since the um, since the shift of money, since the shift money shift, since the shift money shift, since the money shifted across the hedge funds, yeah. I think around about two thousand around that time, then the nature of film development and TV development changed. Um, and more and more now people, especially because it's a craft that everybody's trying, like like, like the lottery in a way, they expect you to, to work, um, they expect you to work speculatively for so long on projects. Yeah. I mean, and you, and the plus side of that is that you own it um, when you're working speculatively, that it is yours, that you are the boss. And and um, and sometimes that can work out nicely, like it did in your case, where you were show running. You had the experience of show running a show, and you you know, and, and you got the BBC behind you. You know, it's all going to go very well. I'm sure. Well, I, had, I had them behind me for a, a brief moment of time until Digital decided they didn't want it. So I was I was right up top of the hill and then down. <laughs> well, I did. I got. I made. Um, Quite a lot of stuff for the BBC, um, right up to sort of 97, 90, you know, 98, 99, or around about then, you know, because obviously I'd done stuff like Doctor Who and then done stuff which was which was an American production, really, but was money from the BBC as well, you know, it was, um, uh, but I'd also done the, they had Screen Twos then, which was like the BBC answer to Film on Four. Right. Um, where you you'd make film, you'd make basically make films, and I made two of those, like one called Hallelujah Anyhow, that you know played Sundance, did really well in in ninety two, and then and then in ninety seven ninety eight, I made another film called Mother Time with Gene McKee, and uh, and that was uh, and that did well as well. We got a good audience for it, um, but it's it, that was like a sort of BBC Two Christmas movie about. A mother who's an alcoholic whose kids lock her in a sauna because um, they think it'll dry her out, and, uh, and then they take on her identity. So that's called Mother Time, 
and and I love they, that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's a it's so it's a very very dark, very dark Christmas movie. Um, of course, nobody wants to watch. So yeah. so so, but I but I I, I like the BBC because they'll because like uh, because it's a sort of a, what is it? Um, it's one stop shopping. You know, you're getting you're getting the subscription money, um, uh, and as, and the, that so it means that the money's there. There's no real equivalent here. I suppose HBO for a little while. Um, Netflix for a little while, they become this this one place where where the subscription is paying for everything. So therefore, but here, if you make a film for Netflix, you know the money you get to make it with that's all the money you're ever going to make from that project. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why you know when they go to the sort of star names like Scorsese, those films are costing like two hundred million because everybody's cashing in at the production stage. I think. Um, the, I don't know how you're feeling about it as a tangent, but a lot of these blockbuster movies are coming out at 200 million, right? And they are massively underperforming. And I wonder if it's A, time to start reining in budgets, or, <laughs> or B, to realise that people aren't going to the cinema as much as we were pre-COVID. Because these... Well, th do you think... Lot. I don't think that's the case in America. I think okay. people are going to the cinema more now here. Oh, okay. I think it's, it's you go down to any of the shopping centres, the malls, you know, they're packed solid um, with people going to see films. There's a tremendous thirst for people to go out and see films at the moment. Um, so, so the performancing, the performances has come up. I know in the UK because we had the Doctor Who Am I came out last year in in in. Uh, in the UK, and uh, it was 22 actually it came out. It was only briefly, and it was a struggle to get anybody to go and sort of actually go and see it. Um, uh, I mean, it so wasn't it, anywhere near me, and that upset me. It was. It was on in Edinburgh. Where are you? I'm in Glasgow with a young. Oh, family. you're right. It was on in <laughs> Edinburgh. Um, they there were a group of people from Glasgow who made a trip the, the across. Who's they tra traps a lot. It was an excellent documentary. I loved it because. Oh, thank you. Because you, yeah. I don't, I don't know that you seem so hesitant for a while to kind of embrace the. I didn't want to do it. Yeah, it was it was Vanessa who, who sort of pulled me into it. But um, what? But what was yeah. that? Like, what? What stopped you from embracing the hoop? Because like people love the TV movie. They did, and I found that out. But for a long time, I didn't think they liked it at all. Um, so, so for a long time, it was it, were, it wasn't even regarded as canon, uh, even though Paul was Russell going Russell off and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so there, so there was a. The, I mean, at, at the beginning of making documentary, didn't really know what 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 it was about i mean yeah. this is the problem with documentaries is quite often you'll go in and you say I, I love this arena and then then you get in there and you find the story um and uh it was also a new exercise to me i'd never co-directed before and i was co-directing with vanessa yule um and she's the editor so she's really the main storyteller technically um because the editing and documentaries is all um i mean i the, the story came, you know, and obviously there were other stories. There were lots of other stories, but but um, it was um, it was very sort of um, uh, I, I literally it was it was an act of friendship. You know, some people, some movies are born out of a desire to save a fish or or um, or do something you know worthy, um, and. Um, in this case, it was we we both done. Um, Vanessa had worked on two of my previous films, um, Your Good Friend and Bar America, and and she'd she'd um, um, and we were good friends. And her father had just passed, and she was up visiting um, San Francisco, and uh, which was where I was living at that time, and uh, um, and she had no idea that I I. I'd done uh, the Eighth Doctor or anything like that, so she was surprised because it came up in conversation because I was saying that I'd been invited to these strange conventions <laughs> and I hadn't been, 
and that, for them so she said we should go you know there's a story there um because you don't particularly want to go so that's the story um so so i thought i thought well yeah why not it's certainly gonna be a weekend and it ended up you know so almost eight years of our lives on and off you know trying to get the thing right and trying that's to get it sold we used um yeah we used indiegogo um to get crowd crowdfunding which obviously made sense there because because there was at the very least the three or four thousand um american doctor who fans who go travel around the conventions here um and then there's obviously you know hundreds of thousands of of doctor who fans millions around the world but but trying to access them on a large scale was very difficult you need marketing money to do that yeah. and so so we were lucky um and uh and but we kept going i mean that was the main thing and it was mainly vanessa who kept going because she was editing so it was she was she did a lot more work than i did keeping the show going and then and then eventually we got into the um you know you spend a whole year going out to festivals and no festival took us all the way through sort of 21 2021 20, we were sitting there thinking oh dear you know we really have lost this one and then um and then finally some people watch it and that was all that really needed was people yeah. to watch it because it's it's not a bad film and, and when they watched it they would they took it on so they so it got picked up by um london um the, the science london science fiction film festival um and they they pushed it hard and the guardian loved it the, we, we got it to the guy who runs the guardian film page and he loved it so they did an article on it nice. combinate and then we also got into the melbourne um, in australia the melbourne um, documentary film festival and so with those two festivals we were then able to sort of attract and and some good press coverage and reviews we were able to attract kaleidoscope who who, who then came to us and did a distribution deal um and then we got gravitas here so right. that's a case point where you know this sort of thing when you're developing small indie films which is what i really have been doing more of in the in the past sort of 10 15 years um has this this business of of doing it is is it's rare that 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 story happens um uh, you know for the most part you make your film you you you'll find an audience for it be it at festivals or whatever you have a nice time showing it and then it'll sit there on some sub, sub, subscription service or on or on amazon or whatever and people who want it can see it if there's any way if i was to sit back and approach this whole thing again um, uh, um uh, or if i was in your shoes um i would focus on how do you get the marketing money for a project where is the where is the marketing going how are you going to get the audience to come in and know about what you're doing um seems that people who are who are savvy on the marketing front um have have a lot more uh, have a bigger hit rate in, in terms of getting stuff made so i think that's that's not because we shy away from it. we say oh no i'm an artist you know i can't be concerned with what other people think um and um but but i think if you can if there's any way in which you can focus on on um, on where's where is your where is your audience find them build them yeah. um then i think that's the quickest way i think what came with the doctor who movie was that you had that pre-built audience already yes and we were all, i mean i so i think i came into the world of doctor who when i was 15 so that would have been 99 so doctor who was long gone at that point and it was a friend yeah. of high school who said have you heard of doctor who and i was like no what is that and he introduced me to the five doctors and that was my introduction and we kind of we had he had all he had what was available on videotape at the time God, yes ever videotapes and yeah, we, did it, we did it all that way and then we got to the tv movie and i remember it, it had a tribute to john pertwee at the start or at the end i think because he had just mm -hmm. passed and yeah. i think it was horrifically unfair that roseanne went out at the same time <laughs> 
You're right. It was, it was, I don't think it was that though. I mean, obviously, I've mean, done a lot of research for years. I thought, oh, well, we just lost the ratings battle. That's the reason it didn't happen. It wasn't that. Um, Fox were keen. Right. They, did, they did turn around and they did say, we want the show. Um, and it was Universal that had to choose between, between doing another season of a show called Sliders, oh, which was also about time travel, um, and doing... Um, a show which they didn't understand, which was Doctor Who. Do I mean, the Tom Thayer and the, the people at Universal just didn't understand it. So, so they, um, so obviously they they went well. Well, we're going to do sliders, and, yeah. and that got the green light, and, and and so therefore it was Universal kind of pulling out at that point, even though Fox had had said, yeah, we do want to, because Fox were keen to go to a series. Obviously, we were up in. Um, I was co-producer on it as well as the writer, and oh, right. and, and uh, so oh, you know, obviously they'd had other writers prior to me. They tried um, to get it off off the ground, in one way or another, um, as a TV series through Ambling, and they had a couple of writers, and and all came to a sticky end because because Spielberg, who was attached at that point didn't like what the writers were doing um, and they gave up and at that point they went to Fox um, because this is where the tenacity of Philip Siegel kicked in. He went to Fox and convinced Fox. Now the guy who ran Fox TV movies at that time was a guy called Trevor Walton who knew me from um, way back in the National Youth Theatre in the 1970s, you know, we, I, and he was Tracy Ullman's agent, and he was, oh, wow. he was, you know what I mean? He was, he was a Brit, and and very, very, very nice man indeed. And so, uh, and then, and then he discovered. He said, "Well, Matthew would be good for this because he's done Young Indy," and so everybody knew me. Yeah. So they all came, came um, knocking, and uh, and then it was quite quick. I remember it just being, I only had a few months to get the whole thing done um, and uh, in terms of the script. And then it was green light, the flashing green light on and off and all the way to shooting. And then it was going out. So the whole, so it never rains, but it pours. And, you know, we had like five million, six million budget. And we were going up to um, Vancouver because, because um, that X-Files had just stopped shooting there. So they had all the infrastructure for X-Files, which Fox wanted to use. So they were keen to use this as a backdoor pilot, quickly get things going. And that's why we spent nearly $2 million on the TARDIS set, which was this elaborate thing that was built. And it was, and it was a beautiful, beautiful set. And a lot of great work went into the TV movie. Um, and it, and I don't regret it for an instant. No, I don't regret it at all because it led to me getting another job. Every job, every time you do something, you, you, you've just, there's one word, you've got to think next. Yeah. What am I going to do now? Yeah. And, and the minute you start thinking like that, um, then you, it kind of gives you a little shield, a little layer of armor um and because you it's like next so okay that didn't happen next let's make let's get emperor's new groove to happen in one way or another because at that point it was called kingdom of the sun and, and um or or i and i developed a science fiction movie for zoetrope um called you know which with um francis was which was who was going to direct it and, and it didn't happen but it was it was a it, disney came in and paid for the script and we went a long way um, to it happening so so it's a kind of a in terms of development um but so I always think about you know don't, don't don't wait you know just get the next thing moving along is, uh, is, and i'm sure you do that yeah i've got i think i've got about four on oil <laughs> just in case i used to have this i think i've still got it um where I came up with an idea for a web series originally about a superhero in Glasgow, because I hadn't done before. So it was about a vigilante with superpowers, and it was in Glasgow, and we did two seasons of it. We did a movie, 
I got to go out to the LA film, the American film market. I got to experience at the age of 21, 22. So I did the whole thing, met with Yui Bo, interesting man, and then uh, came back. The movie premiered at the Glasgow Film Festival. We sold out in seven days. All of our tickets sold out in seven days. Fantastic. The views were awful. Which film was this? It it was called Night is Day. Night is Day. I make up weird titles. Um, You do. It's on Amazon Prime as well, but we had we had no money, literally no money, um, and we went and made this. We shot this film over about seven weekends, and we just went and made a superhero movie in Glasgow. Did you go to Did you go to film school or anything like that? I, I went to college, so I, Which, I. Where did you study then? I went to James Watt in Greenock because my whole family's from Greenock, yeah. so that's like yeah. a proper industrial town. And um, I studied, I I quit, (laughs) I quit halfway into my second year, and I'll tell you why I quit. Um, We were waiting and waiting and waiting until it came time when we were all going to finally make our own short films. And then I discovered that it would go to a committee, and you all had to pitch your film, and then the committee would decide which short films they were going to make. And I stubbornly said, well, they're not going to pick what I write, because I'm a sci-fi writer. I grew up in Doctor Who and Blake Seven yeah. and Blade Runner and all that sort of stuff. I was like, there's no way they're going to pick me. So I quit. <laughs> I quit college, started my own production company, Silly Wee Films, and then yeah. I got hit by a car. So I got ran down pretty quick, broke my oh. entire body. Um, oh, no. I'm, oh, I'm fine now. I'm good. Um, came, out, came out of that, and then I was like, right, I'm going to go make my web series. So I went and made Night is Day. And it, I made Night is Day after Russell's first series of Doctor Who came on. And we were right. waiting for series two. And I was like, well, I'm going to go make something while we're waiting for series two. So I went and made Night is Day, made a second series, made a film. And I've just, I've, I'm so used to just doing all of my own stuff. Yes. Because there is no, there's f- film funding bodies here and TV funding bodies here. But for whatever reason, we can't seem to click. There's no yeah, I I was I had similar problems that I did I did do stuff for the B, BFI um, paid for um, Hallelujah Anyhow and they and I and a short that I directed but they paid for this Hallelujah Anyhow and uh, and I co-wrote it with a, a dub poet Jean Vinterbreeze who sadly passed now but was a, she was a great poet and it was about the sort of Afro Caribbean community in London. And I was, um, and it was mainly, um, um, it was mainly Colin McCabe at that time was the runner of of, uh, of the British Film Institute, and uh, and then they got, so they finally got, you know, we finally did this script and we, we wrote the script together, and I was going to direct it, and and um, and then uh, and then it goes into the meeting, and everybody else on the committee didn't realize that I wasn't black. And and so suddenly it was like, they were saying, we can't do this because he's white. And it was that simple, that simple of, oh, because uh, we're talking about like 1990, 1989, 1980, 80, 88, I think it was around this time, 88, 88, 89. And uh, they, they, and it was, it was that simple. And then Colin McCabe went to Mark Shivers at the BBC and said, it's ridiculous, you know, my, the, the BFI won't finance this all the way. And at that time, I'd worked a lot with, at that time, Mingella was doing, Tony Mingella was, was doing, um, uh, it was called Cello then, it became Truly Madly Deeply, it was also a BBC, um, uh, a screen on to screen two. And, uh, and so very quickly, um, Mangella, who I tra- who had taught me, had been my teacher at, at the whole drama department, and who I was relatively good friends with. Um, uh, we, you know, was oh Matthew's great, you know, and and uh, and, and also I'd done some stuff for Henson's with him, for Jim Henson's with him, with him as well. Also another, you know, Jim Henson hour. He'd done another one. I'd done. So we so so he pushed it, and and luckily that film happened. Otherwise, it would have been the arbitrary decision of a committee 
to sort of squash that film. Um, uh, and we ended up making make we ended up making it. it did very well, and and it was and I still think it's practically one of the few, one of the few films that's out there about the sort of gospel scene in London and about the you know not about drugs basically not yeah. about not about all of the sort of the cliches that would be written about in that era. Um, so it was a it was very much a. a I, I know what you mean when you say once these committees get their power, they it's like they hold on to it and they have their favorite people who they love working with and they build them up. And they, if they look at you and they say, oh, he's into sci fi, part of them is saying he's going to do okay. He's, you know, he's, you're gonna, you, you've, you've got a definite market. Part of their, their job is to provide funding for films that don't normally get funding. Um, uh, I, still think it's, I still think it is extremely limiting in Scotland. Like, it's really hard. Is it? Yeah. I, I always I, think the Scottish have it made because it's such a... I've only shot one film in Scotland. We did a version of Law, Lawn of Doom, right. which we had, to, we, we had to shoot in Scotland, not far from Glasgow, actually. Um, and um, and it, was, uh, it was great because it was the only place where, you know, Lawn of Doom is obviously set Cornwall, but Cornwall is impossible. It's all telephone lines and things like that. And we were not in Scotland. <laughs> uh, not in Scotland. It was great. We had Robert Newton playing the Grant, and he had to be carried over the hill on a litter. He was the, he was he was elderly at that time. It was a great cast. I wish the script had been better for them. Um, it was it was a great it was a great cast, and they they carried him over the hill. They built a village in the middle of nowhere. Um, they uh, I uh, they had like I think ten horses which they ran in a circle around the camera um, yeah. and <laughs> to make it look like more. It was it was that kind of a production. It was fun. It was cool. Magic of film and television, but no, it's it's hard here. Like there's what like I I I'm assembling a group of Scottish based writers at the moment, and we're kind of great together to like sh protect one another, shield one another, because everyone I speak to. They all say the same thing. So it's it's Creative Scotland's our funding body, and we all say, so how how many times have you been rejected? How many times have you been knocked back? And it's not we're not all sci-fi writers, we're not all fantasy writers, but you know we are. We're across the board, and like it, it's so difficult to crack that. And even Isn't it? I think it. I I think more than ever in that case it's it's about the audience you know it's about it's about really trying to cultivate an audience. You're back um, to your person. Pardon. You're back to your marketing person to kind of whip out because I've watched yeah the great you, you do that you can short circuit all these funding bodies um, because then it becomes a very simple um, simple thing. Here's here's the audience um, they want this. Um, and and then you, then you just have. To, I know it sounds simple, but it it really isn't. I've got you know, this is an entire town, Los Angeles, completely devoted to films. It's it's like there's a there's, and you go into a um, into a cafe here. There's always, especially in the, uh, the part of LA I'm in, is is it's like it's like. It's all screenwriters. They're all sitting there. They're all they're all writing. It's it's, it's sobering to say the least. Exactly. <laughs> yes, sitting there with their with their thing talking, or sometimes they're even having their writers' meetings, which is really distracting. Um, and uh, so I'll go in there for maybe an hour or some or an hour or two at the beginning of the day just to be somewhere else to get out of here. Um, and uh, and then, and I'll also do any other job. That, like I take doing quite a bit of acting, and it's and it's so. But it's nice to be in a place where the the sort of it's the main job of the town, yeah. um, and so so you don't feel alone. Yeah. Um, but I know that I'm in the UK, even in Marin, um, you know, even up in the north of California, I would often feel very alone. It's the loneliness, I think. That um that that makes it hard. Then you become dependent on these 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 committees and bodies because it's it's a shortcut to it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. 
you know, I, I don't know how anybody actually makes it, uh, uh, you know, do, does well in this business. You have to just focus towards doing stuff that you like. And then if you can look at that and you can go, oh, well, I like how that came out. Like I like how Emperor's New Groove ended up as something that was quite different to the, to the script that, um, the scripts that um, Roger Allers and I did. Um, of uh, Kingdom of the Sun, but it was the same characters. Yeah. It was still Isma, it was still Pacha, you know, it was still, um, it was still essentially there was Cusco and uh, all, and the story of an uh, arrogant prince that gets turned into a llama and has to hack his way back to being a human by discovering the meaning of friendship. He, that story um, was always the same, right, for, right from the beginning. So we ended up with original story credit, but it took, I think we started in, in 1995 um, and it took all those years. And it's one of the few films where there was a lot of executive interference. And I think it, at the end of the day, it was a better film because of the executive interference. I, 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 I loved what we were aiming for, which, was, which I would call the Lama King because Roger had done The Lion King. What we were aiming for was, um, was, was a sort of beautiful musical with a love story. And it was, it was kind of like The Lion King, but with llamas. Yeah. And, so, and so when it got changed into more of like a Warner Brothers um, cartoon, um, and I really loved the way it went. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I, so it's a case in point where somebody had their head screwed on um, in, in there because at the end of the day, it's a film that I'm very proud of. Um, and now I've got a lot of films that I'm not proud of, but, but, I, but I'm very proud. God, I shouldn't say that, but there's a lot of films that, that I've made that I wish I could have done my job better. I'm not criticizing anybody else who worked on it, but I look at it and I go, ah, oh, I, could, I could have done that better now. I think, um, but I think we all feel that. I think it's good to check yourself as well to realise that you can do another pass or you can you can go away from it for a while and come back and maybe look at it at a different position. Like I think that's yes. like again a lot of new writers, I was gonna say young writers, but that's not fair. A lot of new writers will come in and go, Here is my first draft done, go make my film and you'll go, Well what about your notes? No, no, I don't need any notes. And I've seen I've I've had that firsthand. I've had it said to my face. I don't have time for notes. I don't have time for a second draft. And you're like, cool, good luck. And the feature film that I did, the one film that I made that went out to the LA film, American, I don't know why, I call it the LA film market because it was in LA. The American film market and Glasgow Film Festival. I didn't have a script editor. I didn't have second drafts or whatever. And I am the same as you. I watch that movie and I go, I wish I was better at my job. Yeah. And it's okay. That's how you learn. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 fine. It's fine to be able to. I mean, some people that that so much pride is riding um, on the on the film. So much personal pride. You, you like we were talking about, you know, babies. And it's like it's your baby. And you hope that it's going to be okay. You don't know. You don't know how it's going to grow up. You don't know how who it's going to make friends with. You don't know if it's, it's, yeah, it's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you one more with, question. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a personal one for me. Um, how, how important is your gut instinct on a script? So your gut oh. feeling. Um, so if do you mean when I'm writing or when I'm reading somebody else's script? I think when, I think when you're writing and someone will come along and say, instead of, do, instead of this, do that, how important is it to stick to your gut? Um, it's very important. Uh, you, I mean, there's a part of, um, there's a part of me that, that will, you know, if somebody's, if somebody's paying me to write, and and then I will try what they what they're talking about. But like we said at the beginning, that what's important for me is to sort of try and look, listen to people, but don't do what they tell you to do. 
try and work out why they're asking you to do that. And, and um, if you can work that out, then, then that, that I suppose is an intellectual thing rather than a gut thing. Um, but, but quite often my gut will tell me, nah, you know, that, that solution they come up with there in those notes isn't something I would do. Um, uh, so my gut will tell me, I'm not gonna do that. Um, I will do, and then my response is um, not, I'm not gonna do that. My response is, I want, I, why, do you, why do you ask this? Why have you given me that note? Thinking like that, thinking like that. Well, there may be a better way. You know what I mean? Is, is to sort of find, find a way of answering people's notes with a better solution. So, the, so they still feel the ownership of, and they should, of their of their of their note you know so that when they've given you a note like this characters well can you make this character less boring great um <laughs> and then and then 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 you want to find out why it's boring oh it's boring because next to this character or whatever whatever reason then you find okay that's how i want to i need to shift the emphasis around and so so notes are really important but your gut instinct um, uh, is also Im Im important. Your your the real trick is to try and work out why you're getting the note. Um, and some people get to that in a completely. They'll get to it in a sort of in a different. There are some people who are so sort of egocentric that unless a new idea comes from them, they don't think it's the right idea. Um, so so. Quite often, when you're dealing with people like that, and I've had to deal with you know, pe people like that, that that you have to do this dance, whereby you get that you get them to take ownership um, of of the note, as it were, or of the, of the idea. So it's this there's the in the sort of the intricate politics of of script development is quite fascinating. I've never seen anybody really write. Uh, Maybe it's been written about, but I've never seen anybody um, really write about write about that. They're, most people, when they write about writing, they write about it as a sort of a fait accompli. You know, they 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 say, "Well, this is what you should do." This this. The truth is, there's no answers. You went through the experience of 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 having somebody saying, "Oh, you need to write an outline." I went through whole film school, trained, and everything. It ended up working when I graduated. A couple of years after I graduated, I got this fantastic opportunity to work with Gerard Brach, who is who is Polanski's writer, um, and uh, and I was flying out to Paris each week, and and I would go. And this was in the early eighties or whenever it was before the Channel, and um, and uh, he refused to do outlines of any kind. He said, "We're writing an erotic thriller set in Hong Kong." So I, he was a famous acrophobic. I was sent off to Hong Kong to do all the research. This was for Roger Christian, um, the guy I told you about earlier, and and uh, and he refused, refused, refused. He said, he said, if it's a thriller, um, and you try and work out what's going to happen, you, it, it'll show, um, and it'll, like, okay. it'll look, it'll look. So I went, okay, you're the boss, you know. So the the result. Was the result wasn't very good. I got fired. He got fired. Um, everybody got fired, um, and the, the the film didn't happen. But um, but it was great. It was a great experience, um, and I learned a lot. I really did. And you got a really nice research holiday out of it. I think that's important. Oh, that's <laughs> the whole reason. So that's that 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 right there. That's the whole reason I love writing is, is I love the research. I adore doing even if I'm here doing research, just just churning churn stuff out. But 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 what what I really love it is when you have to go off to Spain or Africa or or Israel or or Haifa. I mean, you know, I've done trips Australia, all, all these trips, building building research. It's great. You're somebody else. You're on somebody else's dime. The, you're there. You. It's the best holiday ever. Is research. That's not bad. But anyway, thank you. I listen. Hope, hope some of this is useful. And so I mean, 
I I may edit my own scripts. I don't edit my own videos, so it'll just go up raw. Oh, okay. I think that's better. I I I, I work sometimes with a, a blogger called Stuart Bannerman, and he does these podcast video things all the time. And he we will sit down and we'll talk about whatever new movies out this week or whatever, and then we'll be on for like about an hour and a half, and then. Two hours later, your video, the video will be online, and like you've not edited any of this. Like, no, no, I don't believe in that. And I went, you know what? I I respect your talents. Like, like there's nothing, there's never anything that you're not afraid to use. So um, no, it's so it's been great. Well, look out for a film. Um, I think it's coming out in Brit in 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 Britain. It's called Traveling Light, which Bernard Rose directed. Okay. That we made, and that that might be that's interesting. I'm in it. But the way I work on those kind of films with Bernard is there's there is no script we improvise, wow. um, so so um, there there is a cat there are characters he works out the characters he works out well you know, and we discuss all of that but then we get together and and uh, and we and we sh- and that one is that one's quite that's quite interesting it's set yeah. during the pandemic take a look so I don't know if it's available there yet but if it is that's the next one that's coming out find it. I have a way of finding things but. It has been a nice to meet you because I know we chatted on Twitter beforehand. Um, yes, we'll do our awkward sign off. I'll stop recording and then I'll have a proper goodbye. Okay. But um, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for imparting us with your knowledge. Um, Thank you. Very useful, um, and I'm sure everyone watching will get something out of it. Thanks, Fraser. It was it was great. Thank you. It was a blast. And now I will stop recording. Somehow, here we go. <laughs>